Good morning, everybody. I've got uh, a number of announcements today, and first of which is uh, that I'm not Sam Kim, I'm James King. I'm filling in for him while he's out. And um, I'm, I'm going to turn down the volume on my own live stream here. I want to say, first of all, thanks. And also, good morning to Carolyn and Darla and Catherine and Jacqueline and Deanna and Connie and Carol, who are all checking in, who are all kind of saying good morning on Facebook. So good morning to you. And I also want to see if we can, I don't know if you could see each other, but if you could just kind of turn to the person who's on the farthest side or, or, or the most far away from you in, in a particular room or area and just say hello and a good morning to, to whomever is here. If you don't know who they are, you're not sure if you like them or not, just pretend that they are someone that you definitely do. Um, uh, I have some news to share with you uh, that's a, a, a little bit of a, a serious news that uh, a brother uh, and a son of Burbank First, a longtime member, Ed Roberts, has died. And um, that was on August 9th. And um, the service date, time, and location are uh, to be determined. So I'm going to presume that when those things are ready to be announced, that they will be. But we want to keep um, the Roberts family and and all of us um, here and beyond who may have known him, um, that we keep all of us and each other in prayer. Um, I also uh, get to announce that Camp Wrightwood registration forms for families planning to go, I think it's family camp, um, from September 10th through the 12th. Uh, is available. I think you got to go to Fran for it. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where they are. Fran, do you have them? Yes. Okay. All right. Fran has them. And um, I want you to know, listen, um, if you're wondering, Pastor Sam will be there, will be there. So uh, if you miss it, you'll be in trouble. So don't get in trouble. Make sure that you get to there. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You'll be in trouble with a spouse. She is a teacher. Yes, no, just kidding. So, okay, all right. Um, today is um, Back to School Sunday uh, and uh, kind of a special day uh, of the year for us churches. Um, usually it'd be kind of a, a different kind of a deal than it is right now. I want to tell you, first of all, that light snacks uh, will be available after worship, but um you know, these are a little bit of different times, um, times in which as if, if, if you were here or you listened last week, that could be a bit stressful for um, those of us who are working at school um, and those of us who are sending people to school, whether they are our little ones or, or our loved ones. And um, it's kind of a mix of, a, it's a good to be back together, uh, and at the same time, there's uh, so much happening. And uh, on this Back to School Sunday, um, we just might ask ourselves, like, what do we have to look forward to with our schools? And um, I just want to say just something real quick, a big thanks to all of us who are a part of um, taking in our children of uh, uh, anywhere in the whole world right now uh, and how difficult that it is. And, um, and I hope that we can, it may not be apparent on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're a teacher and you're watching, this is for you too. Um, and anyone else taking care of children, uh, this is the future in the making today. It's the future in the making today. That's how important it is. And, uh, and I know that so many of us, uh, almost all of us doing our best, um, have to understand the meaning behind it. And there's a lot of it. I hope that you feel the support of this church. And I want to uh, say a little bit of a prayer for that. So if you will pray with me just uh, for a second here. Creator God, we are so 
um, grateful that in um, the ability for us to also procreate, uh, you show in us a glimpse, just a glimpse of what it's like for new life to come about. And quite frankly, it's pretty fragile. It's pretty fragile. And we pray for all those of us who uh, go to school in whatever capacity that may be. And we also pray for all of us who um, know someone uh, who is a part of that, care for someone, think about someone, worry about someone who is a part of that. We pray that we may all come to see what it is that our schools and our young people and our younger people are, the future in the making today. And we pray that with that kind of meaning, we can uh, step into another week of school with courage uh, all the way from our homes to the very classrooms uh, that so many of us find ourselves in on a daily basis. Basis. On this Back to School Sunday, we look forward to what we have uh, this coming year. Um, we may not always know what's in store, but we pray that what we may find inside is something that comes about in these kinds of times. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a short video uh, about this, so let's take a look. I'm the children's director here at Burbank First, and today's a very exciting day. We are back to school, and it Yay! is so good to have our kids back, and we wish all of our educators, all of our teachers, a wonderful year. It's a tradition at our church to give out Bibles to third graders or fourth graders, sometimes fifth graders, so that they can study and learn and grow in their faith. And today, we have a couple of students that are hunting for their Bibles. Hmm, they're still Sarah, looking. You know, sometimes what happens is we give out Bibles and then they get hidden in their room. They get put under their bed and they don't find them. But you found one and Harlow's still looking. I'll help you, Harlow. We want to make sure that our kids can find their Bibles and read them and study and grow in their faith. Harlow might need a little help. He's getting cold. Oh, you're getting hotter. You're getting hotter. You're getting oh, yeah. hot. You're getting more, oh, you're on fire. Oh, you are on fire. Yay. So come here. Tell me. Henry, going into fourth grade this year, are you excited? Yes. Yes. Bible. What is your favorite Bible story? Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. That's one of my favorite. All the animals go on there, and they get saved from the big rain. And Harlow, tell me, what is your favorite Bible story? The Christmas story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a great story. And every year we get to dress up as animals and, and play it out in our church. Awesome. Well, there you go. We've got our Bibles, and now we're ready for a new year. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. How could it could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages
step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours for Well, um, it is time for our final installment in this kind of six-week time that we've been having with myself, and um, I am really, really grateful for all the people who have been kind enough to be uh, kind enough to be kind to me, and um, just um, just everything from the uh, sign at the front that said "Welcome back, James." I don't know. I don't think many of you know this. It's kind of a well-kept secret that uh, the last time I was here, I came uh, about five minutes after worship started. That's, that's when I got here. And, uh, and even after that, I was welcomed. And today uh, will be um, my last Sunday, and I'm so grateful to have gotten to know so many of you and to be here with you. Um, I want to start with a little bit of a prayer, uh, read our scripture and have 
kind of our sermon time and get to our closing song. So if you will close your eyes and bow your heads with me for just a moment, let us pray. Loving God, we, uh, we are here, whether we are here um, in this particular location or we are here in spirit or we are present where we need to be today, uh, including a classroom, uh, as one of us um, are in, is in. We are aware of the fact that um, things look kind of peaceful. Things are quiet in this room. Things are not so much uh, maybe in our hearts. Things are not so much for sure in this world. And uh, this past week and recently, we keep in prayer the country known as Afghanistan, the people of that area, the people who have been there for a while, people who have recently been sent there, the people who are praying every day for loved ones who are over there, for those who have a concern about how things turn out, and also for those of us who have a concern about how things have turned out. This way, we pray uh, for Afghanistan, the area. We pray for anyone who feels desperate in these times. We pray for anyone who finds themselves in the rubble of earthquakes like in Haiti. We pray for those who find themselves uh, in the way of a hurricane and tropical storms. We pray for all those who experience famine and poverty. Uh, and those of us here who are experiencing drought and extreme temperatures. We pray because sometimes it's all we feel like we can do. And as we open up our hearts, as we reach out with our hands and arms to you, we pray that you would hold us. We pray that you hold us who pray these prayers. We pray that you hold the us who we do not know yet. We pray that you would hold us as in our present and our future. And with these things in mind now, we open up the scriptures to see what you might have to say for us. And so we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read scripture for us. I think I'm going to be able to get through it. So here goes. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, that is, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. We read this last week. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And here we go. 
this last part. Then Jesus said to Simon, he, he says that he said this, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. I want to read it one more time, this last part. I just want to set the stage here for what we're going to talk about briefly. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will wish, <laughs> wish fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. From now on, you will. From now on, you will what? Literally. Because uh, I asked this a couple of Sundays ago. I said, you know, who grew up? Who of us, who among us grew up? How many of us grew up in the church and, you know, a bunch of us, almost all of us, raise our hands. That's great. I'm one of them. Uh, almost every time I heard any kind of sermon on this passage at the end here, there was no question. There was no question as to why these people would suddenly leave everything and follow this guy. But... I'm here today to actually ask the question, why in the world would anyone who just met somebody who's a stranger ask them, take them in the boat to the middle of the whatever, I don't know, lake, ocean, sea? It's not an ocean, so it's kind of lake. And do these things, turn to them, a bunch of fish come in the boat, and then he says, don't worry about it. Don't be scared. From now on, you will fish for people. Uh, does that sound like something that you want to do? I think that the writers, I mean, this is half joking, half serious. I'm being half, jo half joking, half serious. That the writers of whoever wrote Luke, you know, kind of in between uh, the, that this people part, you will fish for people part, and verse 11 here, so they pulled in between that part. There's something missing here. There's a, there's a part missing. It's the part where Simon says, says this, quote, what the heck are you talking about? What the heck are you talking about? What do you mean, fish for people? As I have said before, I am fishing for fish. And I would like to stay here. I don't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to change my job. I would like to go home. I would like to have somewhat of a stable life. And for that matter, what do you mean by fish for people? I just threw nets out here. Are you telling me we're going to throw nets at people? What are we going to do? Or is there going to be so much uh, people that we're going to put them into boats? What exactly are you saying that I'm going to do when you say fish for people? And for those of us who have grown up in the church, I'm sorry, we're biased. We're biased. Uh, it makes total sense to us because we've been raised to read this and for it to make total sense to us. And obedience is one of these things that, that becomes a part of us as we grow up in the church. And also authority for most of us, you know, most of us authority. Others of us, you know, not so much, but authority of Jesus becomes a really, really big thing. It becomes assumed. It becomes presumed. Assumed, presumed. Of course someone would. But I don't think so. Who wants to do that? No one told Simon about how much trouble it would be. No one tells him about, uh, these are the terms of the contract. You take it to your attorney, I'll take it to my attorney. See, it's fa if it's favorable, then we'll come back and, and we'll sign. You sign here and I sign here. 
There's not in so much negotiation here. And I honestly feel, I honestly believe that this part right here, uh, that Simon went to go uh, leave everything and, and follow Jesus, was not necessarily uh, out of some kind of agreement that this was what he wanted to do or it was a good idea. To me, it almost also says, could say, could mean that he went to go find out what the heck Jesus is talking about. And I'm not here to say too much today. I'm not here to say too much today. I'm just kind of here to ask one, I mean, just say one thing. I'm not here to say what Jesus meant. Because I think that for many of us today, if our spirits and our souls are open, Jesus is talking to us and has been for a long time. Saying all kinds of things that don't make sense like this. That's my guess. So you decide. You decide what Jesus means when Jesus is talking to you. But the part that I want to point out the part that I think that matters, the part that I think that we need to really pay attention to in August of 2021 is the fact that very, very often, very, very often, Jesus calls people into the unknown and the uncertain and the not so clear. Even the unsafe, how many of them had a great, comfortable life? And he's not about the crowds. He likes the crowds, like the crowds. We need crowds. I hope we have more crowds here. I hope we have crowds in our businesses. I hope we have crowds in our lives. I have, a, me and my spouse, we have a crowd at home, sometimes it's tough to manage but it's good to have a crowd. But this was a trick. Jesus asked Simon to take him to the boat to talk to the crowds, but finished that up, turned around, and talked straight to Simon. No, actually, I'm here. I was here for you. And I have something not clear, not stable, not sure for you, but if you can sense something when I say it, then you know I'm talking to you. If you have a sense of what I'm talking about when I say this kind of thing, then you know I'm just here in person. I've been talking to you for a long time. And I've been working on you for a long time. You can look in the rest of the Gospels. I don't see it. I don't see Jesus saying, follow me into what you are so familiar with. I don't see it. Follow me into something where the first step is something that you have to do. But that first step is the easiest step you could ever take. I don't see it. Follow me, and the way that you follow me is, is, is the, the, what you have to do is what you have the most experience in. I don't see it. Follow me, and what that means by following me is that first you got to put in your opinion on the matter. I don't see that. None of those. Follow me, and that means you don't have any experience in it. You don't have any expertise in it. And you have maybe a relation to it. You have kind of a connection to it. You kind of understand the words that I'm using, but you don't know what I mean. And that is a dangerous place to be. Because sometimes people can take that to mean almost anything. I mean, how many times have we seen in the news that some God told me to do something, to do something not so great? 
And who gets to decide what really is God or not or good or not? Dangerous place. But I'm sorry to say that's what faith is. It's dangerous. You may not be able to feel it with your hands, but it's more dangerous material than some of the things that that the military and the law enforcement and people have to deal with on a daily basis because it has so much power. And I want to say something today. I want to say something today. That it can't be, it can't be that what the point of it all is, is to bottle it up. Minimize the risk, minimize the power. That can't be it. Because if that was it, then that's what we would see in the scriptures. But we don't see that. The question for us today is from now on, what exactly? I hope it's not anything that we have experience in. It's not anything that we have expertise in. It's not even anything that we can put our two cents into. How could Jesus start something with those kinds of people? He'd have to start something with people who first say, I don't get it, let me learn. I'm not sure, let me see. As a primary reaction. Not even what I think about it, what do I think about it, how do I feel about it? In, in, in 2021, middle class, Southern California, we might call that, Curiosity, curiosity, where we feel like, I don't know too much about this, but it'd be nice if I could learn more. Other times, you know, those of us who are growing up in the church, as I've said before, it's obedience and and showing respect to authority. Don't question it, just follow it. Whatever name we want to put on it. Whatever characteristic we want to put on it, it takes one thing, which is a step. We have to take a step. And I hope that whatever this might mean for you, that you are able to take just one step. It doesn't have to be all the steps. It doesn't have to be every step. We don't even know how many there are and what those are. It has to just be one step, one. And once we take one step, we get to take a look around. We get to take a look around and see how many other people took one step too. And then we're not so alone anymore. We're not so alone anymore because we see from the line who took one step. We're not so alone anymore. And we might be working on different projects, but we are all people who took one step. Every once in a while, I'm ending with this, I think about uh, my dad. My dad came with my mom uh, and me uh, in the 80s, late 80s from Korea. They had little clue as to where they were going. They thought that if they landed at LAX, everything would look like New York because that's all they saw in the books that they had, that that's what America was. America was (laughs) all the skyscrapers and the the kind of uh, uh, building landscape of New York. And then they came and we uh, first went to the suburb of Norwalk. And then they said, wait a minute. This is not the America (laughs) that we were uh, looking at in the books. And they came because uh, some words of assurance a little bit from my mom's sister who had been here for a while, a long time. Her and her husband uh, came even earlier than that, started off uh, 
uh, at office buildings, cleaning at night, sometimes driving home with their children. My cousins now, who are all grown up, have children of their own. Not being able to give their children even McDonald's because uh, they didn't have the money for that. And they said that at their church, there's an opening. There's an opening for a pastor. And so just with that, my parents decided to uh, pack everything up and come on over and at least enroll in school, things like that. When I think about it, I think to myself, this was not a very sound decision-making process. Did they not know that as a three-year-old person, they should not be taking risks like that for them? You know, now becoming a parent, I think to myself, this was not a very good decision. This was not very well thought through, well thought out. Ultimately, uh, he was already, my dad was already a Methodist clergy person in Korea. Uh, one of the first churches that he got appointed to, he, uh, him and my mom had to walk through mud and over hills to get to the church only to find that the doors of the church were nailed shut by two two by fours in an X like this. That's where he was appointed to, <laughs> his very first appointment. And uh, eventually came on over and became a clergy in the United Methodist Church. Uh, almost 10 years ago now, it's not almost 10 years ago, but in the year that our first, uh, my spouse and I's uh, first one was born, he died. He died of cancer. It was fast. It was fast. He uh, got the diagnosis after feeling some pain and then uh, went through surgery. And then after surgery, it was not all gone. And from that time, it was only about five months until he, uh, he died. But during that five months, it was a really difficult uh, five months for a lot of reasons. But one of the things that I will never forget is that even in his pain, he uh, really wanted me to, he was very, very excited um, that I was appointed. I was appointed. He was very, very excited that I was appointed to a church. And uh, you know what I needed was I needed a, a robe. I needed a robe because <laughs> I'm a first time pastor and, uh, and I think that I need a robe. Little did I know that they said, pastor, Pastor James, no one wears a robe here. It's too hot in the sanctuary. <laughs> That's what they said. But anyway, uh, I went to go get a robe, and but he insisted that he would get one for me. He would get one for me. And uh, it's not the first time that he would get anything for me. Uh, one of the things that I needed for seminary school of theology as I was uh, uh, in school to become a pastor was something called the Book of Worship. And one day I said, um, Appa is what I is what you call uh, dads in Korean. Uh, I need a book of worship. And uh, he said, oh, okay, I have one for you. I said, what are you talking about? And he went to the closet and he opened up the closet door, brought out a white box. And in the white box was a brand new United Methodist book of worship. He said, I, I got this for you years ago. One day you might need it. And he gave it to me. And uh, this was years before he died, and now he wants to get me a robe. So he gets me a robe, and I get to use that robe. I get to use that robe preaching. I get to use that robe all different kinds of times. And then he dies. And I keep that robe for a while. Now I don't have that robe anymore. I don't have it. Uh, at a certain point, I was able to let that go. But when I had that robe, and I saw that robe, and I put on that robe, I kind of felt like, thanks, Dad. Thanks. Thanks for this. You know? And I kind of felt like that I could do this good. I could do this good because I have this on my dad got it for me. Big deal, a really, really big deal. And as I was continuing to live my life, though, kind of thinking about every once in a while, putting this on, thinking about my dad, one day I opened up kind of my closet and I looked at 
all the different kinds of clothing that I have that are not robes, a suit, you know, just regular clothes. And I thought to myself, in my prayers about my calling, I thought to myself something, which was that, you know, any one of these clothes, any number of these clothes, my dad could have gotten for me too. And he would have if he wanted to. And this robe thing is super special. It's super special. But it's not the only thing that I could wear. It's not the only thing that I could wear. And any other thing that I could wear, what I do in it, it may not necessarily be the clothes that he gave to me, but what I would do would not be any less what I am able to do because of who he was and how he was with me. And from then on, I began to see that this robe was super special, but I can let it go. And I can ask myself, what is the next thing that maybe he would have bought me? What, is the, what are the other things that he would have wanted to provide? Because it would not have been just that. It would have been so much more, so much more than that. Even today, uh, I go to Rose Hills is where he is. I don't even know why I go. It's not like he's there. You know what I'm saying? I go every once in a while to just kind of talk about how I feel, how things are going. I feel like he would be the only person to understand what it's like to be in a pastoral role. Not even, you know, my spouse or for that matter, even my mom, you know. Um, but here's why I say this. Here's why I say this. Uh, he wasn't wearing a robe when he decided with my mom that it was time to cross an ocean and come over here. He was not in a robe when he himself sensed the calling to the ministry. He was not in a robe when he met my mom and decided to, I don't know, I think it's, it was a good idea for them to get together and things like that. He was not in a robe when he made some of the most important decisions of his life and went through the times of great uncertainty. And it was not even because of any robe. And it did not have to do with the robe. It had to do with God which the robe and the Bible and this church building and the titles that we hold in this place and the kind of rank that we might have and the experience that we say that we have and how long we have been in the church and how much we have put into it, all those things are symbols of what it means to be in touch with the living God. It is, those things are not God, God self. Those things are what happens when the power of God comes to life and animates things, including people. They are themselves not God. And if we might be so bold, it's not about understanding what is next. It's not about having stability and safety. Those things are not what's necessary. What's necessary is, can I hear the voice? Do I have the sensitivity? And if not, then what does it take to have that? Because Burbank First Family, all of us who are 
on Facebook. It's not about those things that we might usually think. It is about when we take a look at our life, can we see the evidence, evidence of God's power at work? And I believe the reason why that this scripture passage speaks to me is because we are in a time where we better find ourselves becoming more accustomed to that. It is the new normal. I'm sorry. It seems to be that way. But in that time, we are not powerless nor victims. We are those made in the image of God to help bring something about. About. We may not know what that is yet, but I'm putting my bets on the fact that it'll be something great if we just take the first step. And now in this time, as we consider uh, what that might mean for us, we will enter into a closing song. Those of us who grew up in the United Methodist Church, we may know. Let us enter into this closing song in prayer.
Thanks to all of uh, those who've been working hard on these kinds of uh, mu uh, music videos and song videos, and you know who you are. Um, not everyone knows who you are, but uh, really, really um, big, big thanks to you. It's time to respond to uh, to the word, and uh, you see the website right there is the way that you can give, and you can also um, give in things through the mail, things being like checks and things like that. Don't send any cash. Uh, but beyond that, I, I pray that it is our very lives that we continue to give not only to God, but in the name of God and to what it is that we do. Um, I, it brings me to the point now where we have a, a little bit of a benediction and ascending forth, and then we'll have a postlude. So if I may so ask of us, could we all stand for a second? Uh, those of us who are able, you don't have to, uh, just those of us who are able, and remember, we have this postlude afterwards. I'm going to see if I can stand for a second and get us now to uh, remember that from now on, uh, we will, we will, uh, so many things, and that in many more ways than we think, it's uh, a blank at that end, uh, waiting to be filled. And I pray that with courage and conviction, we may take the first step to fill in that blank a little bit. Uh, this week, wherever we are here and in our own everyday lives, uh, I pray that we might be able to do now. Amen.